All right. Okay. Thank you very much uh, once again for coming. Second of uh, the brief encounter sessions. Uh, it's a particular privilege and pleasure to introduce to you uh, the most notorious playwright in Britain. Um, uh, um, uh, Sarah Kane's reputation <coughs> was kick-started, for better or for worse, by this stunned reception that her play lasted at the Royal Court uh, received. Described by some um, headlines as a disgusting feast of the film, um, which is probably one of the nicest about it. Um, the play was in part a response to the unfolding unbelievable atrocities uh, in the former Yugoslavia, but also an indictment of the brutality of family relationships closer to home. Subsequent plays, particularly Fear to Love and Cleanse, have also been studied with uh, moments of horrifying cruelty. And yet what critics persistently miss, it seems to me, is first of all, uh, a rich train of humour that runs through a lot of the plays. It seems to me that people didn't notice that there was anything funny going on last time at all. Um, and secondly, also, that I, it seems to me that violence is not so much uh, Sarah Kane's main theme, which is probably a big contradiction for saying this, but uh, that <coughs> perhaps her main subject is love, the possibility of love under the conditions of the brutality that she describes. Um, while her work has been met here with the blanking comprehension and hostility that uh, I've described, uh, her work has been widely performed across Europe um, and beyond in Australia and America. Um, last year, shortly, shortly to open in France. Um, and I'm sure she would agree that her career was capped this year. She was mentioned in the Evening Standards list of the 50 bright young things in London, which I think is probably the best thing that could happen to you. Okay, I want to, <coughs> I want to start then with the obvious question uh, for critics. There are playwrights who get <coughs> bad reviews quite consistently. Uh, I can't think of any playwright who's got quite such personal, vitriolic, hostile reviews that you have. Do you, why do you think that is? Um, because they don't know what else to say. <laughs> I honestly think that's true. If, if they don't know what to say about the work, um, they go for the writer or the director or the actors. Um, and I think what happened with Blasted, um, it's quite hard to talk about the press response to my other plays because it's inevitably so clouded by what happened with Blasted and everyone is constantly re-reviewing Blasted. I think Michael Billington must review Blasted more than any other play he's ever seen. I'm permanently reading about Blasted, even now. Um, but I think what happened on um, that particular press night, um, it was a bit strange. The court had programmed the play into a dead spot. They didn't really know what to do with it. A lot of the people in the building didn't want to do it. They were a bit embarrassed about it, um, so they put it into a spot just after Christmas where no one was going to the theatre anyway, and hopefully no one would notice. Um, and it was in the theatre upstairs. And what usually happens in the theatre upstairs, which is about this size probably, um, is they have two press nights, because um, if you have one, then every single seat is full of press, and it's completely unbearable. So you have two, and then you have a slightly mixed audience on both nights. Um, because... <laughs> Because everyone was a bit haphazard at the court at that time, they failed to notice there was a major press night on at another theatre, the Almeida in London, on one of those press nights. So they were all coming on the same night anyway. Um, so I was sitting at the back <coughs> with a friend, and I looked round and realised, you know, the director was somewhere near the front. Everyone else was a critic. Um, I think there were about three other women in the audience. Everyone else was a middle-aged, white, middle-class man, and most of them had sort of played jackets on. <laughs> um, and it was literally only at that point that I realised the main character in my play was a middle-aged male journalist um, <laughs> who not only rapes his young girlfriend, but that is then raped and mutilated himself. And it suddenly occurred to me they were going to like it. It genuinely hadn't. I really thought they were going to like it. I thought this is really good. I love it. Um, and then the next morning, um, there was just complete chaos. Um, my agent couldn't get up and call me, and there were apparently tabloid shows running around the Royal Court going, where is she? <laughs> She's at home in bed, you know, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, 
And a lot of it passed me by at the time. Um, my father's a tabloid journalist. He very kindly didn't give my address to any other tabloid journalists. Um, and they never caught up with me. Um, but I think largely what happened was that um, I, I, what I attempted to do, and it seems I think probably succeeded, was create a form um, for which I couldn't think of an obvious direct precedent. Um, so it wasn't possible to say this form is exactly like a form in a play written 20 years ago. I wanted to create a form that hadn't happened before. Um, and because the form hadn't happened before, no one knew what to say. Michael Billington couldn't say, ah, oh, this is a nice bit of social realism, I can talk about this. He couldn't say, it's surrealism and I don't like that, therefore don't go and see it. So what he could say was, this writer is clearly mentally ill and she should be locked away. And um, the Daily Mail did actually suggest that the money spent on the play should be spent on getting some therapy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I agree, but that's just, it's really not the point. Um, but I genuinely think it's because if they don't have um, a clear framework within which to locate the play, then they can't talk about it. So they have to talk about other things, right. um, such as the writer's personal life, um, their mental health, whatever it might be. There, there does seem to be an enormous all the reviews. The, there is a, there is the, the list paragraph. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they, the most of them kind of said, oh, that. At yeah. the Royal Court last night, we witnessed the great deal of a new play by Ms. Kane, which they don't like to, to talk about. It features the following. <coughs> Right, masturbation. Masturbation, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, the list is always wrong. Yeah. It always includes an underage, mentally retarded girl being cracked on by a dog or something. <laughs> <laughs> that actually didn't happen. And a lot of the time it happened because once the story got picked up as a news story, it was no longer the people who'd seen it actually writing about it. It was, I mean, people like my father, it was tabloid hacks, who, you know, if they don't know the facts, make them up because that's what their job is. Um, so, yeah, there's always the list. It's usually inaccurate. Um, and the list of contents is not a review. But it doesn't only happen to me. I think it happens to most new plays that what you get is a um, brief synopsis and you get a list of things that happen. And then a little note at the end saying whether or not this particular <coughs> middle-aged male journalist liked this play and whether or not you should go and see it. And it tells you nothing. I mean, it tells you possibly what's in the play. But if you list the contents of any play, it doesn't. It really doesn't tell you if it's any good or not. I mean, that that is, in a sense, you you have very clear insight into what makes a very bad theatre critic, mm. which is the kind of responses you have. Um, what do you? How do you? What do you think would be, would be a possible definition of a good theatre critic? How would they behave? They'd resign. <laughs> do something else. Um, you see, I can't, it's almost an oxymoron for me, good theatre critic, you know, um, military intelligence, I think. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm off a Christian scientist, free love. Um, I think um, probably, probably George Bernard Shaw is the best right. critic there has been. And of course he was a writer. Right. And I think the best critics are probably people who are writers, whether or not they write for a living or something else. But... Um, and I think people who don't consider that to be their primary role on the planet, um, I mean, I think what frequently happens with theatre critics is they genuinely see their job, whether they acknowledge this consciously or not, as to destroy people. And they do their utmost to do it, they really do. Um, but I think if they also have another, I hate the word career, but if they have another line of interest in um, art, then they're far less likely to do that. Um, I'd quite like to review plays. In fact, I got asked to review um, Harold Pinter's Ashes to Ashes for The Observer. Um, and I was really keen to do it, and then they phoned me up and said, yeah, if you don't like it, that would be great. And I thought, oh, um, <laughs> um, you know, complete set up, so right. I didn't want to do it. But I think, um, I think playwrights reviewing other plays would be really interesting. Right. Um, but I think genuinely caring about whether or not the play is good and actually wanting it to be good are prerequisites and not this kind of joy in how vitriolic can you be. Right. 
Steve is then the big on that one. I mean, you, as I say, you, you had to work for uh, all over the world. Do you notice any differences in terms of, well, critical culture, but also maybe generally theatrical cultures in um, Europe? I, I mean, I've noticed that, I mean, my work's m mostly produced in Germany. And I did a press conference there quite recently where I was astonished that, I mean, they were all actually really intelligent. Um, they'd all read all of my work. Um, they had intelligent questions to ask about it. They weren't rude and abusive. They were genuinely interested in coming to see it. I mean, they'd actually prepared in the way that, you know, you hope people prepare when they're doing their work. Um, and that's completely different, I think, to in this country. The number of times I've... You know, I don't actually agree to interviews very often with the press, but a few that I've done recently, and the journalists have turned up to say, I don't actually know any of your work, but... And you think, well, you know, is that really acceptable when if you go to Germany and you're just doing a press conference? It's not even the ones one They do actually prepare. But having said that, although I think the critics are much better out there, the standard of productions generally is much poorer. Um, and you have to allow a certain amount of cultural difference. Um, and I've seen some productions which have been vastly different to what I wrote, but which I've actually quite liked. Um, there was one in Belgium in which it was just after the um, this child abuse room in Brussels had been exposed. The play was on in Brussels. The whole play became about the baby. It was all about the you know, And there were people crying and the audience with the baby was buried. <laughs> Um, and it really, it really didn't have very much. It was bore very little relation to my play, but it was a genuine cultural reinterpretation. And so I sort of accepted it. And on the same terms, it was quite good. <coughs> I felt a bit like my play had been used as a vehicle, but you know. Um, but then at other times, I mean, I went to Hamburg to see Blasted, and um, this man walked on stage, and I thought, "Who's that?" guy in this sort of really trendy leather jacket, greased back hair, sunglasses, wrap around. Who the fuck is that person supposed to be? That 30 year old. And I thought, oh my god, that's supposed to be Ian. And it, that's supposed to be a 45 year old dying man. And, and I thought, and I'm, but I know this character, where have I seen this character? And I thought, it's Tarantino. And my heart just, cut, I mean, it broke. I could hear this cracking in my chest. And I, what, I mean, it was just, uh, it's actually, in, that, in some ways, that becomes quite insulting when um, the work is seen as part of a school, which actually I abhor, and it gets put into that bracket and then reinterpreted in that way. That's really very unpleasant. It's particularly difficult, because I suppose your, uh, your plays don't really easily fit any uh, trend. You said already that the form of last is something anticipated. I mean, the thing that strikes me is that, I mean, tell me if you think this, is, this isn't true, it seems to me that it, in terms of kind of the Royal Court Bush, what they think is a good new play now, it tends to become very, very nationalistic, um, you know, among the underclass. Uh, generally, you're, you just, you, you spend the evening kind of pitying their sorrowful lives. Uh, whereas your plays, um, they, they, they show with them sometimes the moments of violence, as I mentioned, but apart from that, you know, they're, they're playing with naturalism, they're, they're breaking with that form, they have a kind of lyricism about the language. I mean, how do you think you fit, if you do, into London theatrical culture? Well, I, I'm astonished I get produced at all because I don't, I don't feel like I do fit, really. Um, I mean, I started, when, when I left university, the first job I had was at the Bush. Um, as a literary assistant or something. And I spent a lot of time reading scripts and talking with the literary manager. And um, I hated almost, almost, not only almost everything I read, but definitely everything was produced. I mean, if I wrote a report saying, this play is absolutely dreadful, I could be pretty sure it's going to be on within six months. Um, and it was always to do with form. Um, and yeah, it's true. I mean, obviously... There are certain things that tell you to write, there are things you feel you want to write about, and you're certainly right, I, I write about love almost all the time. Um, but driving all that, there's always um, a desire to explore form and to find a new form, 
to find exactly the right form for a particular story or a particular thing I want to examine. Um, and I'm personally very tired of seeing plays about disaffected groups of youths exploring their sexuality um, on a night in, on the beach. And um, I, it's really hard to kind of characterise those pl- I mean, I have a very clear image of a bush play. Um, because I think it got worse there. There is a particular image of court play, which unfortunately it's kind of it was quite quite similar in a way, but slightly more attention seeking. I think the writing. Then blasted happened, and suddenly the royal court became known for well, you know, right. do inanimate objects go up someone's arse, and if they do, <laughs> and it's set on a beach, they're exploring the <laughs> Then probably this is the play for us. Um, and I do think there's still an element of that. In some ways, I feel quite responsible for it, which is awful. But um, I don't think there are very many genuine formal innovators working at the moment. Um, I think Martin Crimp is one who is, who is, you know, he's an older generation. He isn't particularly known or, I think, not even liked very much in a sort of general public. Um, but yeah, there's a particular kind of British form. Um, well, I, was, I don't know. I mean, I was thinking whether it's whether it's kind of a London thing because it does strike me that some of the playwrights, not all of them, but some of the playwrights that I know uh, from Scotland, yeah, uh, right. have very different. You know, if you think of David Gregg, David yeah. Harrower, Chris right. Hannon, you know, they have that kind of they have a sort of lyricism, they have that kind of experimental kind of yeah. theatrical ambition, which uh, you know. Let's say Joe Penhall or other yeah. stuff. Not fair to name people, but no, you know, no, name them. Name them. <laughs> no, kind of Joe Penhall, possibly, and two others don't particularly have. Um, mm. And I wondered because you had because Craig, the, the last play that you wrote, toured with Peg Fowl, had a residency up at Travers Theatre yeah. during the festival. Is that something that you kind of thought? Oh, there is a different air and purity. Oh, I, no! I always wanted to be in Scotland. Right. I, um, opening up the Traverse was the high, it's been the highlight of my life, probably. I was really wanting to open play at the Traverse, and um, yeah, I mean, you've named three of my favourite writers: Harrow, Craig, and Hallam. Um And it might be to do with the fact that there are masses of writers produced in London at the moment who get an absurd amount of national attention. Um, I mean, I always find it ridiculous when I have a play on in London, the Glasgow Herald will come down and review it. And I think, why? Is anyone seriously going to get on a train from Glasgow and come down to see it unless they're a mate, in which case they'll come anyway? Um, and I can't say I notice, you know, the independent rushing off up to sit to review things, really. Um, and there is a complete imbalance in the press, which means, for example, Joe Penable is more generally known than David Gregg, who's a far better writer. Um, but also, I think because there are more writers produced in London, there are inevitably more bad ones. Um, but then again, I mean, you think three of the best writers at the moment are all from Scotland. What's that about? Um, I don't think there are three writers as good as those three working in London. Um, I don't know. It's something dead culturally, certainly. The, um, you mentioned, um, again, I'm still hammering on about this now, this yeah. playing with matches. You said that <coughs> you, you talked about how you kind of evolve these things, the form has to fit the play that you're working with. I suppose I wanted to just ask you a, a very general question in a sense, which is uh, how do you write, by which I mean <coughs> almost kind of physically? You know, what things come first? Do you write in kind of great screeds for sort of twenty four hours without stopping or Yeah. Um things? it's different for every each thing that I write and it often depends on um at what stage I'm at. Um first draft stage I tend to write an awful lot of rubbish very quickly. Um and it has no form at all. Um Blasted was a very particular journey and I think because it was the first play I wasn't really aware of what I was doing formally. I mean, I knew what I was doing, but I wasn't consciously aware in the way that I am now. Um, I mean, within two pages of starting to write Crave, I thought, oh, I can see what this form's going to be, how interesting. 
last suit I was, you know, it wasn't until six months after it closed that I went, oh, that's what I was doing. Um, and I think with Blasted, it was a, a direct response to the material as it began to happen. Um, I mean, I knew I wanted to write um, a play about a man and a woman in a hotel room, and that there was a completely, a complete power imbalance, um, which resulted in a rape. And I started writing that, and I was, you know, writing away. I'd been doing it for a few days, and I switched on the news one night while I was having a break from writing. And there was a very old woman's face, woman in Srebrenica, just weeping and weeping and looking into the camera and saying, um, please, please, somebody help us. We, just, we need the UN to come here and help us. We need someone to do something. And I was sitting there watching and I thought, no one's going no to do anything. How many times have I seen another old woman crying from another town in Bosnia? under siege and no one does anything and I thought this is absolutely terrible and I'm writing this ridiculous play about two people in the room what does it matter what's the point of carrying on so this is what I want to write about and yet somehow this story about this man and woman was still attracting me and I thought so what could possibly be the connection between a common rape in a Leeds hotel room and what's happening in Bosnia and then suddenly this penny dropped and I thought of course it's obvious one is, you know, the seed, and the other is the tree. Um, and I, I do think that the um, the seeds of full-scale war can always be found in peacetime civilization. And I think the war between so-called civilization and what happened in Central Europe is very, very thin, and it can get torn down at any time. Um, and then I had to find a way of formally making that link, thinking. You know, how do, I, how do I say that what's happening in this country between two people in a room could lead to that or is emotionally linked to that? Um, and then at some point, I, I think I actually had a conversation with David Gregg about this, about Aristotle's unities, time, place and action. David's the perfect man to talk to about this. And I thought, okay, what I have to do is keep the same place but alter the time and action. Or you can actually reverse it and look at it the other way around, that the time and place stay the same. No, the time and the action stay the same, but the place changes. It depends actually how you look at the play. You can look at it either way. <clears throat> and at that point, I began to think, is there a precedent? If there's a precedent, I don't want to do it. I'm not interested. And I couldn't think of a play. David went off looking at the play. He couldn't think of one. Um, and then I needed an event. I think in the first draft, the soldier literally just, he began to appear at different points. It was like Ian was hallucinating, and I just thought, this is awful, it's kind of American expressionism. Um, and then I think what, I, what it needs is what happens in war, is suddenly, violently, without any warning whatsoever, people's lives are completely ripped to pieces. Um, so I literally just picked a moment in the play. I thought, I'll plant a bomb, just blow the whole fucking thing up. And I love the idea of it as well, that you have a nice little box set in a studio theatre somewhere and you blow it up, because that's what I've always wanted to do. So <laughs> just blow it up. It's that thing, you know, you go to the bush and you go in, you see the set and you go, oh no. Um, and I was always longing for it to blow up. So it was such a, a joy for me to be able to do that. Um, but for me, the form did exactly mirror um, the content. And for me, the form is the meaning of the play, which is that um, people's lives are thrown into complete chaos with absolutely no warning whatsoever. Um, physically, how I haven't asked the question at all. Physically, how I write, half the time I can't remember. I seriously have a finished script and I think, God, when did I do that? <laughs> I just seem to have been hanging around drinking coffee for six months and here's a play. Um, I do, it happens very haphazardly and brokenly, and sometimes I write masses, and sometimes I mean, the thing I'm writing at the moment, I'm literally like writing a line in a notebook. No idea where it belongs in the play, but I know it's in there somewhere. Um, so I, I think probably these days it was different with Blasted, but I tend to amass material before I start with. Uh, um, how far do you think about the 
practicalities of staging. And the reason I... I've <laughs> been asked this before, you know. I've asked in, this, in a tactful way. Uh, but I'm thinking of things like... The, uh, what is, remind me what the last resurrection of the of love is. A vulture descends and begins to eat his body. Yes, right. That, for example. <laughs> then there's, there's every single page of cleanse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that shouts, you'll never put this on to save your life. Mm. Um, is that, I mean, do you, is there a sense in which you kind of think, eh, <laughs> <laughs> see what they do. Uh. Or, is, or is it just that you're, you're doing what you want to do and that's their problem? Well, you know, there was a crucial moment when I started writing Blasted. I can't remember what the crucial moment was, but back then I was directing plays. I started out acting, and then I realised I didn't really like directors very much, so I started directing. And then I realised there weren't really that many plays that I liked, so I started writing. And so, while I was writing Blasted, there was this crucial moment. It may have been the bomb going off, I can't remember, when I thought I wouldn't know how to direct this. And it was a, it was a sort of key moment. I thought, either I write a play that I could direct, or I write a play that I need to write, knowing that I can't direct it. And it was very, it was a very tough decision. And in the end, I thought, well, the play has to come first. I'm, do, I'm writing as a writer. I'm not writing as a director. That's completely doesn't make any sense. So I wrote the ridiculous stage direction, whatever, whichever one it was. He eats the baby or something, probably. Um, then I think. And I did think, it's someone else's problem, it's not my problem. Page was love, I had great fun writing, because there were so many ridiculous things, like, you know, they cut off his genitals and throw them to a dog, you know? <laughs> and you think, well, it's not my problem, and then suddenly it was, because I ended up directing it. Um, <laughs> uh, but that was very interesting, because when I'd watched Blasted, very often I didn't see exactly what I'd written, and it would really annoy me. Um, but suddenly... I was confronted with just how difficult it is to create the images that I write. Um, but I really like doing it. Now, Cleanse is another story altogether. Um, no one ever believes this, but it's totally true. Um, I, was ha- I was having a particular sort of fit about all this naturalistic rubbish that was being produced. And I decided I wanted to write a play that could never, ever be turned into a film. It could never, ever be shot for television could never be turned into a novel. The only thing that could ever be done with it was it could be staged. And believe it or not, that play is cleansed. (laughs) That play can only be staged. Now, you may say it can't be staged, but it can't be anything else either. That's the point. It can only be done in a theatre. And I thought, yes, of course I knew they were possible stage directions. But I also genuinely believe you can do anything on stage, both in terms of you know, causing offence, but um, pragmatically, you can do anything on stage. There's absolutely nothing you can't represent one way or another. It may not be represented naturalistically. It's completely impossible to do plans naturalistically because half the audience would die just from sheer grief if you did that play naturalistically. Um, But that was kind of the point. I never asked for it. I never asked for people to actually chop legs off or real rats. Well, there is a production in Germany that's using real rats, apparently. They've been rehearsing rats for six months. (laughs) I'm really serious. Um, But I wanted to write something that was totally, totally theatrical. It was nothing. It couldn't be anything else. Um, And... But there was also part of me that wanted to direct cleanse, so that was a bit of a problem. But, um, but I thought in the end you have to write the thing that you want. And when you write a stage direction, you, for me, I'm not actually writing, you know, the stage manager carries this on and this winch comes up here. And what I'm writing is um, the effect of everything. The effect we get is we understand that someone's feet have been cut off. How you do that is a completely different thing, and how you make that into a coherent production is another thing. Um, but for me, it's never about the actual thing. It's not about, um, you know, someone writes down how much he loves someone, so his hands get chopped off. It's not about the actual chop. It's about that person can no longer express love with his hands. 
and what does that mean? Um, and I think the less naturalistically you show those things, the more likely people are to be thinking, what does this mean? What is the meaning of this act, rather than, fucking hell, how did they do that? <laughs> Which is really not that interesting a response to a letter from an audience, because, you know, David Copperfield can do that. Um. I'm going to ask another question and then uh, throw Sarah over to you. The rocks. <laughs> you, so um, start obviously formulating precise gem questions. Um, uh, you, you directed Pleasure's Love, so you kind of write. You also acted because you were in Cleanse. Mm. So how did that come about, out of the report? How did that come uh, well, there's, there are rumours circulating that I pushed an actress downstairs. It's not true. She, um, her dog was trying to have sex with another dog in a park, and she was pulling it off and slipped this. How oh, how very Sarah Kay. <laughs> <laughs> it would be. But, um, that is, was it a for me? <laughs> that is honestly what happened. Um, and so we sort of sat there for two days going, what are we going to do? Could it be pushed back in place? But the problem was that um, she had to be flown halfway up the wall and do all sorts of extraordinary things, which is just not possible to do with a slip disc. Um, so we were going to close, um, at which point I got very depressed and thought, I can't quite bear for the play to end in this way. And in a moment of rashness, I said, Well, look, I'm no blind, I can do it. And the next thing I knew, <laughs> I was being flown halfway up a wall and going, no, we can't do this. Um, but in the end, I did, I did the last three nights. And it was amazing. And I'm doing Crave as well. That's not the <laughs> I am, yeah, I'm shoving actresses downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> things dropping out of the sky. Um, well, did, you, did you kind of learn anything else about your writing? I mean, the way that directing a play, you talked about yeah. writing. What did you learn about it from acting? I learned, A, how difficult acting is, and B, how easy acting is. Um, and everyone makes it so very, very complicated, and it's really not. In fact, it's an extremely simple thing, and actually it's the simplicity that makes it difficult. Um, and what, I mean, I can't talk about all acting, but what Cleansed asked for was extreme simplicity. Um, and that's a very, very difficult thing to do when you're standing in front of 400 people with no clothes on. Be simple. Do you know what I mean? Your, your instinct is to run away. <laughs> um, but actually, it's a very simple thing. What do I want? What, is, what, what do I feel? And how do I enable myself to feel that? Um, I also learned how difficult it is to do that, particularly in a play like Cleansed, where um, you kind of disappear through a hole in the stage you have precisely three and a half seconds to remove all your clothes, run around the back of the stage, get into a thing and come whizzing up through another hole. Um, and I think at one point I said to one of the other actors, God, this is really hard, isn't it? He went, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realised that I wasn't very popular. Um, um, but it, it was interesting, being the only person in the entire world who's ever been in and seen the production of Clans, um, it is extraordinary how different it is. I mean, God, this sounds like, you know, it's like, how do you learn your lines? How different it is sitting here and watching it and being in it. I mean, for a start, it seems to last about 15 minutes when you're in it. And when you watch it, it goes on forever. Um, but it, it was a very, very different journey through the play, but one which I liked. It suddenly became extremely clear to me. Exactly what you said. I thought, oh, they're all just, they're all just in love. I thought it's actually very sixties and hippie. It's just this. They are all emanating great love and need, and going after what they need. And um, the obstacles in the way are extremely unpleasant. That's not what the play is about. Because um, what drives people is need, not the obstacle. It did seem to me when I saw it that. I mean, I have to say, it's probably when it comes to my, I don't think I was in a totally appreciable audience. There were quite a lot of people there who didn't seem to yeah. be very good. Um, were you the other night people shouted at it? No, they oh, were right, quite okay. strange. No, no, people actually like shouted yeah. at it sometimes. Really? Yeah. Oh, they, were, they were walking upstairs and it was pretty unpleasant. But it did, it, when, I, when I came out the theatre, I thought this is probably the most, and I mean it in the best possible way, it's the most romantic play yeah. that yeah. I've seen for years. In that sense, but it seems to be about 
kind of getting romance, stripping everything superfluous off it and seeing what you've got left. And in that sense, it seems to be kind of extraordinarily positive, I mean, kind of mm. ludicrously positive yeah. a play, rather than being this kind of disgusting piece of thought. Anyway, that's what I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any questions for Sarah Kay? Sarah. Um, who did you write for? Me. Fuck everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've only ever written for myself. In fact, the truth is, I've only... <clears throat> I can't believe I'm so damn strange this. I've only ever written in order to escape from hell. And it's never worked. Um, but... At the other end of it, when you sit there and watch something and think, well, that's the most perfect expression of the hell that I felt, then maybe it was worth it. I've never written anything for anyone else, apart from a little comedy play for my dad once, but <laughs> that's very hidden. It'll come out the collection. I'm sure you're okay. going. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like to tell, what do you expect? Um, oh dear. Um, well, as I say with Blasted, I expected them to like it, naively enough. Since then, I've always expected them to hate it, and it's never been as bad as I thought. Um, but for me, sort of expecting something from the audience only ever comes after it's written and I've been through rehearsals. Um, because you can't ever anticipate, I mean, particularly with what happened with Blasted, you can never anticipate that. And actually, if you do anticipate that sort of response, you don't get it. I mean, I know a lot of people who've written things in order to get that kind of response. It just doesn't work. Um, But you can't second-guess audiences, and you can't make them behave in certain ways. I mean, I'm sure everyone in the room knows. Everyone in the room must have been in a relationship where you think, I'm going to make the other person do this, and it completely backfires. And that's one person that you know really well. So imagine trying to, you know, make... 500 people or whatever behave in a particular way and you don't even know it's just not possible Um, so I suppose what I think about when I'm writing is how I want a particular moment or idea to affect me and what the best way of eliciting that response for myself is and if it can make me respond in that way then the chances are there'll be at least one other person who will respond in the same way um, and even if they don't, then it satisfied me, which was the initial <coughs> intention anyway. is a slightly different um, ball game actually um, now I want a bit of paper to draw something up um, it's a, it, a cleansed is, is structurally based on Wojtek Bookman's play which I directed last year um, ok um, alright right, it's the difference between plot and story ok is the thing um, that um, I think story is chronologically what happens, which is, um, um, okay, five years ago there was this man and this woman called Ian and Kate and they had a relationship which went very badly wrong. He was working for MI5 at the time, blah, 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 you get to the end of the story, they're all dead. The plot is there are two people in the hotel room. As you go through it, things from the past are revealed. So it's basically the order of things has changed. The plot is the order in which the story is revealed. 
Okay, so with Blasted, for example, the story and the plot are similar in that um, eventually all of those things are revealed. Okay, with Cleansed, um, okay, sorry, this wiggly line here, which goes up and down, is um, story. Um, and the bits that go up are the sort of moments of high drama, or which you know tend to be violent, unfortunately. Um, and the bits under here are the sort of bits that build up to this. Um, so that's the uh, what did I say? That's the story. Everything above the line is the plot. Okay, so all the stuff underneath you just shed. Um, now, Bookman's Wojtek is an absolutely perfect gem of a play to look at for this, in that anything remotely extraneous or explanatory is completely cut, and all you get is those moments of extremely high drama. Um, and what I was trying to do with Cleansed was a similar thing, but in a different way. Um, and um, when I was directing... I'd actually finished Cleanse when I directed Wojtek. Um But I was playing around with all the different versions because he died before completing the play, so no one really knows what order he meant the scenes to go in. And I sat there with all the scenes on different bits of cards and moved them around, and I thought, when have I done this before? And I thought, I'm going to cleanse this. And I wrote all the storylines, if you like, the Rod and Carl story, the Grace Graham story, the Robin Grace story, um, and the Tinker Stripper story, um, separately. And I thought, and where do they connect? And so I was kind of doing this, moving things around, going completely insane, thinking there's a scene missing, where's the scene? Um, breaking things into two scenes, until eventually I had the thing that I wanted. So inevitably, when you describe it, yes, of course that's what happens, because the only things that happen in the play are the, the moments above that line, when you're kind of up here. Whereas I think with a lot of other plays, there are things like... You know, so then he runs off and tells his father, if you look at Greek drama, and then the messenger comes on, and all of which is much easier to take and gives you time to calm down. Um, but I didn't want to give anyone time to calm down. Um, why is another question, but um, I don't think, I don't, I think there's, um, I wanted to strip everything down. I wanted it to be as small and, when I say small, I mean minimal and poetic and I didn't want to waste any words um, I really hate wasted words and Crave in some ways is at the other end of the scale in that it's got more words than any of my other plays but it's actually about half the length of anything else I've written um, again there's no waste I don't like writing things you really don't need and my favourite exercise is cutting cut, cut, cut um, and I'm much hated at script meetings at the Royal Court because I kind of read people's plays and inevitably I'm kind of, if you just cut that line and that, and it's it's become kind of a habit, but it's, I think it's quite a good one for those of you who write it. Okay. Um, <coughs> Um, I doubt it. When, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was blasted, um, I, it, it, I, w- I went downstairs to my friend, my friend and I said, well, I read this play and I, this is the most devastating effect of <laughs> more than any other play I've ever read. And I, list, I listed that that genesis was a horrific thing. And I'm like, really? I've got to read that? And they're like, please let me read that. And I'm like, but, but I've just told you it's terrific. Like, yeah, I'm going to read it. And I, I thought, isn't that, that's incredible, isn't that? Um, it's my, I've just described the most, what to me was the most shocking thing I've ever read. Mm. And they all want to read it. And is that, is that some of the reasons that you make such extreme things? Because you know, it'll create a um, stir and people... Well, it's and, some of no. some of the extreme things that I've put in my plays, I've put in because I, they're true, and um, I've been so appalled and horrified, but similarly compelled, that I can't help but put them in my plays. Um, when I was writing Blasted, there was some point at which I realised there was a connection with King Lear, um, and I thought, I'm writing about fatherhood, um, there's this scene where he goes mad, there's a, a, and there's this Dover scene with Kate when she unloads the gun, and she's going to give him the gun, and she's not, and it's, 
And I thought, the only thing I don't have in this play is blindness. It's really odd I don't have blindness. And at that time, God knows why, I was reading Bill Bruford's Among the Thugs, so if any of you have read it, about football violence. And there's this the most... You've all read Blasted, so... But the thing is, when people hear it's real, they get even more horrified. It's absolutely appalling. Um, there was a... There was an undercover policeman who I think was planning to be in Manchester United for. He then sucked out one of his eyes, bit it off. You see, you've all read the play and yet you're all reacting like this. Bit it off, spat it out on the floor and threw this guy down and left him there. And I was... I just couldn't fucking believe what I'd read. I couldn't believe that another, a human being could do this to another person, could actually do this, but they had. I put it in the play, everyone was shocked. Then in the rehearsal room, I'd say, well, actually, where this comes from is, and I'd tell them, they would go, oh! you know, and they'd read the play, and I'm like, what, do you think I make this stuff up? <laughs> I don't think it. Jesus Christ, I mean... And there was a similar thing with Robin in Cleansed. It's Robin based on... Um, a young black man who was on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela. Um, he was 18 years old. He was put in Robben Island and told he was going to be there for 45 years. Didn't mean anything to him. He was illiterate. Didn't mean a thing. Nelson Mandela and some of the other prisoners taught him to read and write. He learned to count, realised what 45 years was and hung himself. And I tell people that, you know, I told the actor playing Robin that story and he was really upset and shocked. I said, but you've read the play. You've read the play. It's in there. I don't, I really don't invent very much. Um, I take a look around and, uh, I mean, I hate the idea of drama as journalism and I would never say that I'm a journalist, but um, when it comes to the acts of violence in my plays, my imagination isn't that fucking sick, do you know what I mean? I just read the newspapers. It's not like there's something wrong with me. Um, And all you have to do is look at the world around you and there it is. and I agree with you, Blasted is pretty devastating, um, but the only reason it's really any more devastating than reading a newspaper is because it's got all the boring bits cut out. It's also, though, isn't it, and there's something about... The thing that strikes me about Blasted, which does make it very different from your other plays, is that the other plays have a kind of... There is... It seems to me there's a kind, there's a kind of more tone through, by which... I, I suppose, I mean, there's a sense in which I kind of feel that you are dealing with those mm. things through it. Whereas in Blast, it, it seems extraordinarily raw. In the way that, you know, if you yeah. don't see um, a David Hare play, you know, if you don't see David Hare play, you watch, I think, you watch David Hare play, kind of as if he's sitting next to you, kind of going, now he's a nice character. <laughs> <laughs> You should be quite kind to him, but he's now he's quite unpleasant. So we won't have anything to it. So don't believe a word he says. Yeah. Whereas there's none of that going unblasted. You know, because clearly Ian is a monster, but there's kind of nothing going on in the play that tells us that you believe that as well, which is quite shocking to sit in the audience yeah. watching. Well, the thing is, I don't. No. I don't. I'm <laughs> so excited by that. <laughs> I, I really like him. Right. Um, I think he's funny. <laughs> um, and, um, I mean, I, I can see that other people think that Ian is a bastard, and I knew that they would. Um, but I think he's extremely funny. Um, and the reason I wrote that character was this terrible moral dilemma that was thrown up in me when I... Um, a man that I knew who was dying of lung cancer was terribly, terribly ill who was extremely funny, started telling me the most appalling racist jokes I'd ever heard in my life. And I was completely torn, A, because they were very funny and very good jokes and I'd not heard them before, um, B, because I wanted to tell him I thought he was awful and I was glad he was dying of lung cancer, and C, because he was dying of lung cancer and I thought this poor man would be dead and he probably wouldn't be saying this if he wasn't... So- and it set up all kinds of turmoil in me, but in the end, yes, I liked him. Um, and no, I, I think um, when I wrote Blasted, I, I, I just thought, well, I just want to show these people as they are. Um, and I don't really want to tell people what to think. And the point was, I don't really know what I think of them. Yes, of course, I think he's a monster. I also think he's great. Um, all I knew I was I wanted the soldier to be worse. 
right? <laughs> and I knew that having created Ian, it was going to be a real problem to have someone come through that door who made Ian look like a pussycat. Right. Um, so that was very difficult. But actually, writing the soldier was probably the most difficult thing I've done. Um, but no, I don't really know what I think of any of them. And yes, I think Kate's very fucking stupid. And what's she doing in the hotel room in the first place? Of course, she's going to get raped. But yes, isn't it utterly tragic that this happens to her? Um, and I, I did actually have nights during rehearsals of Blasted when I would go home and cry and say to myself, how could I create such that beautiful woman in order for her to be so abused? And I really did feel kind of a bit sick and deprived. But part of that was to do with the fact that there was no sort of overwhelming sense that um, in the end Kate came out on top. Had there been that, I'm sure I would have felt completely exonerated. But I didn't. But then I don't think in the end those people do come out on top. Um, a couple of questions, really. The first one, um, in Crave, the characters are sort of nameless, they're just mm-hmm. names you deal with them, but um, they're nameless, and they could be, the gender could be interpreted, uh, you know, the cover art could be either male or female. Does that matter? And are you moving away from the sort of gender, the specific genders? Um. Yeah. Well, to me, A was always an older man, um, M was always an older woman, B was always a younger man, and C was always a young woman. I decided not to specify it. I thought there were things that the characters said which made it very clear. For example, it would be very odd if a man said, when I wake, I think my period must have started. It would be very strange. For it would also, it'd also be very strange if a man was saying, kept talking about how much he wanted the baby. But on the other hand, Yes, it could be done. I'm sure I'll see a production in Germany where it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no for fact that will happen. Um, but um, I was trying to do something different with Crave, which was in a way about, um, not really about releasing control, but about opening up options. And in some ways, for me, Crave is very specific. It has very fixed and specific meanings in my mind, which no one else can ever possibly know unless I told them. For example, who here knows what 19971424 means? None of you know. I'm the only person that knows, and the actors know that. And I have no intention of telling anyone what it means. Um, so I can't possibly expect to ever see the same production twice. Thank God. Um, that won't happen. Um, a, B, C, and M, for me, do have specific meanings, which I am prepared to tell you, which is A was, um, A is many things, which is the author, abuser, because they're the same thing, author and abuser, um, Alistair, as in Alistair Crowley, who wrote some interesting books which some of you might like to read, um, Antichrist, uh, my brother came up with Our Soul, which I thought was quite good. Um, and it was also the actor who I originally wrote it for was Kid Andrew. Um, so that was how A came into life. M was simply mother, uh, B was boy, and C was child. Um, but I didn't want to write those things down because then I thought, then they'll get fixed in those things forever, they'll never ever change. Um, and let's face it, it is quite obscure. and. I had a choice of, um, I mean, the play the play's quite obviously very heavily based or influenced by The Wasteland. And I had a choice about, did I write a set of notes to go with the play to explain it? But what happened to T.S. Eliot, poor bastard, I bet he regretted it forever, was everyone got more interested in the notes than the poem, because how can you understand the poem without them? Um, and I really didn't want that to happen, and also I knew the notes section would actually be longer than the script, which would just be ridiculous. Um, so I thought it's a very simple choice. Either I explain everything, um, which means going into enormous detail about my own life, which I didn't really want to do, or I explain nothing. And I thought, I'll explain nothing. And if nobody likes it, who cares? Um, what was the second question? I was going to come. Oh, right, come on then. Um, <laughs> I've been haunted um. by. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's not my fault. I wasn't there. <laughs> I've been haunted by the image of uh, in clan of kicking a pole <laughs> up someone's arse mm. and it coming out of their shoulder. Mm. And I'm just... Is that true? Yes, it is true. It is possible. <laughs> Okay, where that comes from, um, I'm prepared to feel very guilty about laughing. It's um, a form of crucifixion which Serbian soldiers used against Muslims in Bosnia. And they would do it to hundreds and hundreds of Muslims and hang them all up and leave them there, and it would take about five days for them to die. I was just intrigued, I just yeah. know that. It's possible, and unfortunately it happens. Um, and I tend to think actually anything that can be imagined. There's someone somewhere who's done it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I had this, I had this thought about um. <laughs> what am I doing? No, just forget that. Um. Um. But yes, I'm afraid it's true. Okay. Um, I think I've probably got time for a couple of questions. So, you, you two. Okay. Um, you talk about interaction in Canada. No, I write plays. I don't write films for a start. It's not a case of taking something from film moving on stage because I'm not really very interested in films, apart from the one that I've written. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> die hard. Would you? <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> um, it's to me, it's a completely different thing. I think um, Tarantino films. I mean, I'm talking very specifically about Tarantino, not about other directors. Um, although Oliver, St- well, Oliver Stone's different, but um, Tarantino doesn't write about violence or make films about violence. He certainly doesn't write or make films about love. He writes and makes films about film. That's what his films are about. They are about film convention, and they're completely self-referential, and they refer to other historical films and that's all they do um, my plays I hope um, certainly exist within a theatrical tradition not many people would agree with that and they're at a rather extreme end of the theatrical tradition um, but they are not about other plays they're not about um, methods of representation um, on the whole they are about love and about survival and about hope and to me, that's an extremely different thing. So when I go and see a production of Blasted, um, in which all the characters are complete shits, you don't care about them. Um, I mean, the second scene of Blasted in that production um, was after, you know, in the space between the first and the second scene, Kate's been raped during the night. The lights came up. She's lying there on the bed, completely naked, legs apart, covered in blood, kind of mouthing off at Ian. And I just, I just thought this, this is so. Oh God, I just wanted to die in despair. Um, and I said to the director, you know, she's been, she has been raped in the night. Do you, do you think it's either believable, interesting, feasible, theatrically valid that she's lying there completely naked um, in front of the man who's raped her? Does that, you know, do you not think she might cover herself up? example um, and evidently that's not to do with my own feelings about nudity on the stage I mean I've been naked on stage myself I have no problem with it um, it's simply about what is the truth of any given moment and if the truth of a moment is this refers to another film and the one in which someone's head was blown off in that film to me that's completely fucking meaningless um, and I'm just not interested in it um, which is why I've only ever seen one Tarantino film, I'm afraid. I'm talking with great authority about it. I've only seen Reservoir Dogs. But I thought I'd given quite enough of my life to seeing that stuff, and I'm not giving him another second, never mind three hours, whatever the whole production was. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, you've been 
um, spoken about living in New York society of kind of reducing your work and also the using of theatrical tradition. Your work I feel is very innovative and interesting and exciting. And you're a new playwright and your work is getting produced, so you're in a very powerful position. How do you anticipate your work will innovate or influence the theater that is being produced? Oh God. <laughs> um probably all be closed. <laughs> no. um, God, I don't know. Um, I think there's been, qu- I mean, as I said before, I think there's been quite a negative influence. Um, two weeks after Blast was on, I got given a script to read by Royal Court, which was about three people in a basement roasting a body and then eating it. And I thought, I wonder if this person's seen Blast Because <laughs> there were some extraordinary similarities, including even lines. And, um, and there, there have been a whole sort of glut of blasted copies, none of which have been produced, I'm pleased to say. But um, that's certainly a negative influence. In terms of positive influence, I do think there is, there is beginning to be a move away from naturalism. Um, I haven't seen the new Nick Rosso play, I don't know if you have. I'm told that it's, there's a huge leap away from naturalism. What, is that correct? It's a hop. A hop. <laughs> <laughs> a side step. Okay. Um, but I think if that's true, certainly in terms of Nick Rosso's work, that's probably quite a significant side step, given what he's written before. Um, but I don't know, I, I just, I don't know if you can ever anticipate these things. I mean, it's like saying, you know, will the play still be produced in 50 years' time? Will any of us be here in 50 years' time is my question. I really don't know. What would your hope be? My hope would be that I discover there's life after death and that um, I never have to die. <laughs> um, in terms of what happens to my work after I die, I mean, it's just got nothing to do with me. I'm not going to be here. I hope people write better plays. I mean, that's all I can hope. Uh, but I doubt they will. I mean, rubbish has always been produced through the ages. Mediocrity has always been praised. That's simply what happens. And most good plays are only really um, liked in retrospect with hindsight. I mean, there's a sort of thing of quite... It's when Cleansed was on at the Royal Court, and we were, there was one point we were playing to very, very small audiences. Um, I saw, God knows what it was on, but there was this bit of old TV footage of some actors who were in um, Sergeant Musgrave's Dance, one of the most brilliant plays of the last hundred years. And one of the actors was saying, you know, we don't understand it, we think it's a really good play, and last night no one came. I mean, literally no one turned up to see it. Um, and you think about it now, you think it's absolute. So how did it become such a classic, which it has? Um, to me, I think it's kind of anything at which no one turns up at some point <laughs> is bound to turn out to be quite good. Um, and anything that, that sells to packed out audiences, there's probably something wrong with it. There's probably a real problem there. I mean, you have to look at Mojo um, to see that. I don't know how many of you have seen the play and or the film. Um, over thanks for studying it in about three weeks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if Jess comes to talk to you, don't say I said that. Right. <laughs> Remember. Um, the last question is going to have to be, um, which is the, the obvious kind of chat show type plug thing. What are you writing now? <laughs> um, what are you working on? What am I working on? I'm writing a play called 448 Psychosis. And it's about... Well, it's sort of, um, hmm. it's got similarities with Crave, but it's different. Um, it's about a psychotic breakdown. Um, and what happens to a person's mind when the barriers which distinguish between reality and different forms of imagination completely disappear, so that you no longer know the difference between your waking life and your dream life. And also, you no longer, it's very interesting psychosis, you no longer know where you stop and the world starts. So, for example, if I was psychotic, I would literally 
not know the difference between myself, this table, and them. They would all somehow be part of the continuum. Um, and various boundaries begin to collapse. Formally, I'm trying to collapse a few boundaries as well um, to carry on with making the form of content one. Um, that's proving extremely difficult. And I, I'm not going to tell anybody how I'm doing it, because if anybody can get there first, I should be furious. <laughs> um, but it kind of, it's whatever it is that I began with Crave, it's going a step further. Um, and for me, there's a very clear line from Blasted to Fedra's Love to Plans to Crave, and this one is going on through where it goes after that. I'm not quite sure. But.